Hello and good evening, and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting of June 1. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote attendance. The Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom and make public comment during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communication Cable TV Channel 8 and AT&T UVerse Channel 99 and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. The recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Uh, tonight, our technician is Eric Johansson. As a reminder, please remember to turn your cell phones off. And with that, we will have a roll call to start the meeting. Commissioner Esty. Commissioner Jensen. Commissioner Wilk. Vice Chair Christensen. And Chair Westman. Okay, we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Neil here. Under oral communications, first, do we have any additions or deletions from the agenda? There are no additions or deletions to the agenda this evening. Thank you. Okay, next, we will have public comment. Uh, this is an item for short communications from the public concerning matters that are not on our agenda tonight. Members of the public may speak for up to three minutes. Uh, all speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. The commission cannot discuss or take action on any items presented during public comment because those items are not on our agenda tonight. Uh, so with that, uh, is there anyone who would like to make a public comment? We'll have three minutes, and we appreciate it if you sign in so we get your name correctly. Thank you. Check. Okay. I gave you a copy of a letter because I'm not on the agenda, but I did want you to have record of my uh, purpose for being here tonight, and I hope that um, we can come to a solution. But I... Um, was a part of the parklet plan and um, unfortunate due to expense and extension of, of permitting process and building and things like that, I couldn't afford it. Um, I was offered a space by my landlord, which is on a private um, lot next to my, adjacent to my business, um, and that I learned that it also needed to be permitted um, that I was unaware of because it was donated from her in replacement that I could not find the parklet and a reason for um, people to come to my deli and be able to enjoy lunch. So after that, I decided to go ahead and go back to basics and try to um, put in a permit for the sidewalk dining, which I originally had before and during the pandemic. Um, I understand that also needs a permit process. So a little bit of ignorance on my side, but I am um, requesting that I get an extension because the next meeting is not until July or mid or late July. And that will greatly hurt my business if I don't have a place for people to sit. Um, it also attracts people to come into Reef Dog Deli. 
Um, and I think it's overall a good uh, addition for the community, not only my business, um, but a place for people to be attracted to. Um, if I'm granted the use until my permit is finalized, I promise that I'll abide by all the rules and regulations of the city ordinance. I'll keep the space clean. Um, I will uh, uh, keep all additional signs uh, not present or any flags. Um, my seating area is only between 10 and 5 p.m. Wednesday through Sunday at this point. Um, and um, I'm hoping that I get an extension just so that I can't afford the um, can't afford the delay at this point. Um, I'm hoping to make it into 2024, but I'm really hoping that summer helps me get there. Um, I'm also willing that if I fall out of compliance on any of um, the additions that I put in this letter, that I'll remove my seating space immediately. And thank you for your understanding and consideration on this matter. I guess I don't need to ask if you have any questions because we can't discuss that. Can I suggest maybe it is part of the agenda in the sense that we're talking about prototype street dining decks and this might be uh, enfolded into that discussion? Uh, well, it wasn't advertised or noticed as part of the outdoor dining deck, so I don't think according to the Brown Act that we could do that. I mean, Susan, I if I may just make one, one short comment. I understand that it's not a part of the agenda and that I know that the next meeting is not until July. What I'm asking here is just for the use of my sidewalk with the tables. We, we can't make that decision because we don't have the authority to do that without it being on the agenda and an item for us to discuss. Um, you know, again, you have to follow the rules. We have to follow the rules. And um, uh, while we would often like to break the rules like other people do, but that's, that's not something that we can legally do. Thank you for being I'll leave it up to fate. Okay. Uh, moving on, um, the next item is commission comments. I have two comments. One is uh, I would suggest that um, Doug Deli talk to staff. I don't know if you have already, but um, they, my dealings with staff is they're very accommodating. Uh, they might be able to come up, find you a, a solution. Uh, but my other comment is I would like to attend the next meeting by Zoom. I realized when we first got off of Zoom that there was apparently that was a very difficult thing, but I, it's, all the kinks seem to have been worked out since I noticed there have been some city council members attending by Zoom. So can we work with that? We can definitely work with that. We will have to put public notice where you're at. So what? Public notice in Weaverville. Yeah, if you're in a hotel, we've got to put public notice, and um, so we'll work. I'll work with Austin and Julia on on the how to set that up, but it should be no no problem. Okay. Just, there'll just be a, a funny public notice either at the house or um, so we can talk it through and walk you through all the logistics of that. Uh, any other comments from any other commissioners? Uh, staff comments? Um, no comments. I'll have a director's report at the end of the night. Okay. Uh, so we move to approval of the minutes for May 4th, 2023. 
Anybody have any corrections or additions to those minutes? If not, would somebody like to make a motion to approve? I'll move approval. Hmm? I'll move approval. Okay, we have a motion. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Uh, I was absent. Commissioner I Wilkes is abstaining. All right. Uh, now we move to the consent calendar, which we don't have any items on. So we go to the public hearing. And um, the first item under our public hearings is 207, 209, 209A, and 211, the Esplanade. And I believe. We have a commissioner who will recuse herself because she works for the architectural firm involved in this application. Okay, this permit is consideration of alternative colors and materials for the design permit, historical alteration permit, and coastal development permit for facade modifications uh, in the village area. Thank you, Chair Westman, and good evening, Planning Commissioner. Uh, before you this evening is a, an application to modify the previous uh, permit that was approved by Planning Commission um, on April 6th. So the history to this is that the buildings at 207 through 211 Esplanade, it's one structure with four different tenants. The building was damaged on the January 5th storm and emergency repairs and in-kind replacements have been underway. Um, the owner has, as they've been opening walls and finding more and more damage, they've been wanting to make modifications to the facade due to the, low, due to the, um, the facade being potentially historic. Uh, permits are required and planning commission review is required. And as they continue to work on this project, it continues to evolve for um, one, one item that they came up against is at the sandbar, they went to uh, refurbish the doors. They were realizing the doors were in really bad condition. And then while they were with the carpenter, the carpenter's space burnt down. <laughs> so the doors no longer actually exist. At first it was there, it was um, a structure, um, the, the strength of them was no good and now um, it's not even, it's an option to um, replace them in kind if, if necessary. but. So it's just been an evolving project. Um, the, I'll, I'm gonna go over the changes that are before you tonight. Throughout the project, they'd like to have new aluminum doors within an antique bronze color. This is similar to the door that's installed at Zelda's. And I believe um, that a couple of these doors have been installed. And if, if it was, were not approved tonight, they'd have to modify that back to the original design, um, but I think it was just a, an issue of having to have a door in place. Uh, the, the doors that they were trying to get were back ordered and um, there were issues with ordering them. They'd like to reuse the Pizza My Heart window and move it next door to the Bay Bar. Um, our building official will be working on the energy efficiency of that and making sure it meets code in order to make that move. Um, at the Pizza My Heart, they're proposing new aluminum doors also in the antique bronze. And at the sandbar, the new aluminum doors in the antique bronze. Um, on the back of the building, the, the, um, the, sorry, on the top of the slide, you can see what was approved previously by the Planning Commission. On the bottom of the slide is the back facade of what they're proposing. So there's a different layout um, for the windows um, from the lagoon. You can see there were two doors previously um, on the left-hand side, and now they are brought it down to one door, but a similar, similar windows to what's being utilized in the front. Um, and those are a, a great product for being next to the water. Um, on the rear of the building, they were um, originally they had ceramic neolith window surrounds those are very um, difficult to install and i guess easily breakable so as they were getting to know the product they it was not a good fit for installing over a lagoon on the back of the structure 
they had asked to use core 10 um, because the lagoon, the lagoon being under it, I had, staff has concerns with the environment and um, core 10 tends to drip. They do have a, um, a covering that they've, a sealant that they've used in the past that's been successful, but due to the, um, the lagoon and that risk, um, they're, they've agreed to work with staff on the new condition of utilizing a, a similar product that will look like core 10, it'll be a metal, but not core 10, so that we don't have the issue with the leaking. Um, this is a side-by-side -side comparison of what's happening at Bay Bar. So to the left is what was approved, the painted wood, and on the right, they're proposing a wood stain. And here is the revised seascape, um, streetscape. Um, on the bottom, it's a close-up image of the new window system that they're proposing. And then these are the proposed elevations and sections. Uh, so showing the new doors, um, and new materials for the front and back. This is um, the, the sealant that they had proposed on the core 10 and how it would look. This is what it would look like uh, under the staff recommendation of modifying to an alternative with a, it would have a coat over a metal. Um, one recommended condition is that the roll-up window at 211 Esplanade, um, that's, a, that's the sandbar, um, shall be closed from 10 p.m. to close of business each night and during any live entertainment. That's really to protect the hotel across the street is where you have a roll-up window. We actually, um, for the, the wine tasting restaurant right up the street here, when we allowed the roll-up window, the first, that was, we got complaints a lot because it just opens up to more noise on the street. So um, that, we're recommending that change. So staff's recommend, recommendation tonight is to approve the alternate, except substitute the use of the painted aluminum steel-framed portal feature at the rear of the facade at Mai Tai Beach um, and also add the condition of approval that the roll-up windows at 211 Esplanade be closed at 10 p.m. Um, and during live entertainment and with that um, I'm available for any questions. I do have a question about the core 10, the window, the window surround. Uh, I had trouble understanding what the real objection was to that. I asked, talked to Brian about it. It seemed like <coughs> it was just a lot of everybody trying to do everything at once, and there didn't. So they originally came in with the idea of going with the core ten, and then we came back and said, "Well, you should coat it because it rusts." So what if it rusts? If it, it would the, the it mentioned drips on the deck, which it's because it's their property. Uh, and if we're worried about iron oxide in the lagoon, I would be surprised that that's a real environmental effect. I'm on the environmental committee. Um, we worry about E. coli more than chemical pollution. And it's not like it's they're dumping their drains in the lagoon. You're talking about occasional drip of iron oxide, I guess, as an environmental hazard. So to me, there I don't under I don't get why there was all this discussion about them not being able to use core ten. Is it just was it the environmental thing? Was it was it a, a look thing? Um, at first it was well it was because of the marine environment and core ten that it, it will stain buildings, it'll stain, it, it, when the application originally came in and it was reviewed, it had some core 10 over the sidewalk and there was definitely con definite concern on the city's part of, um, one, the look of it, the stain dripping on the white building and the stain on the sidewalk. So you'll, you, you'll notice. Um, so that's a city sidewalk or is that their City sidewalk. So when you, uh, so we went around and we looked at some different buildings that have core 10. The Penny Ice Creamery on 41st Avenue has core 10. And it's, you can see when you look at the sidewalk 
below it, there's a, a line of where that sign is from the dripping that's a, occurred on that sidewalk. So we just, we had concerns the city of drips occurring on our sidewalk. With Within the lagoon, similar concern. We didn't do any environmental analysis on it, but um, the area is actually over the lagoon. It's going to be a, uh, a trim that comes out over, that stands out from the building. But that portion of Mai Tai doesn't have a deck right there, so it's directly over the lagoon. And we just thought it would be smarter to use a different product that's not going to drip. And the reason they get it was the coating? Was it that was a they, they suggested the coating. Um, they've used, the applicant suggested the coating as a solution to, so that it would not drip. Um, the, when we looked at the the informational data sheets regarding that product, it definitely said that it would not drip for eight years. However, we're in a marine environment and just that 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 is the reason. The Planning Commission could reverse that request, but um, we just, I didn't have 100% confidence that forever it wouldn't be an issue, so. Thank you. Okay. Good clarification. Uh, any other questions of staff? So our building official needs to spend more time on that one. Um, but we could approve a, that style of We could approve that style. If we find out that it doesn't meet the rating, then they'll have to substitute it for something else. To substitute it for another one that looks like that one. We'll open this to the public. Uh, anyone interested in commenting on this item? Uh, I think the applicant is here. Uh, Hi. The Esplanade project um, from uh, 207 through 211. We, um, the in uh, response to the court and steel, if we had to be put on a set schedule, instead of if the product the product that um, seals the court and steel lasts for eight years, and you want us to quote it every five years, we'd be happy to do that, or move to the aluminum um, powder coated aluminum um, product. Either way. Um, the roll-up doors that are being moved from the Pizza My Heart to uh, the Bay Bar are single pane. Um, so if we were to be allowed to use or make that um, opening, a roll-up opening, we'd be happy to replace the door or the windows with double pane to meet the current standards. Um, and I can't think any other issues. Um, did you have any questions for me at all? Um, no, I don't. I don't have any. Does anybody else on the commission I have think any? I do. Kind of a clarification. So you said that you're okay with the powder coated aluminum window surround. I think that's what they're talking about doing is moving from the cord and steel to a powder coated or painted aluminum. Is that our recommendation, uh, it's RRM's recommendation, or. Or, or, or like I said, using the cord and steel and having it. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to make it easy on you. I don't want to have to, you know, go, they go through a long redesign process or whatever. So, you know, if, if, if the powder coated aluminum is good for everyone, that sounds like the easiest quick answer, right?
so that's consistent with your recommendations. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have it worded so they have some flexibility to come up with a list for each one of them. But just to make sure it's not, not being real specific. Okay. And then the aluminum doors, I think in planning, they okayed an aluminum door. They didn't want vinyl windows or doors. Um, and then uh, Chris Shaw, I know that he's done a lot of cabinet work for all of us here in the community and his business burnt down um, about three weeks or four weeks ago. And the doors that we were originally gonna use uh, got lost in that fire. Oh, one other question, I'm sorry. So you're, you're okay with the rat staff recommendations though in terms of the conditions? Absolutely. Okay, thank yeah. you. I hope so. <laughs> you know how it is. It's um, a building that hasn't been touched or opened up in 35 years or 40 years. And every time you peel something back, you discover something new. So. I, I don't think so, no. My understanding is that there's still additional stucco to be opened up on the back of the building, but the plan is to replace with stucco. So I think if anything changed there, it would be internal and hopefully not design related. And no design issues at all or um, updates. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, uh, I want to thank all of you also. You, you, you've all been a great partner in this project. Um, there's been a lot of leeway on um, help with getting this fast tracked and d done quickly and all that. And we really appreciate that. And I know the businesses down there appreciate being able to get back up on their feet. So I wanted to the opportunity to thank down you all for this afternoon. It looks very nice. Yeah. Yeah. But they've been, they've installed a lot of the doors and everything. And I was impressed at how well it looks and hopefully all the businesses. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be a great, add to the community down there. It'll be a beautiful spot when we're done. And just one quick comment, just from a community perspective. Um, we appreciate how nice the project looks at the end of the day. I walk down there a lot in the morning and it's amazing that you guys are doing that much construction and then it's that clean. And so uh, from a community perspective, it just appreciated that how well it's kept up and cleaned and, yeah, we're, we're and like on the weekends, you know, I think we're all trying to advertise to the community that capital is open and everything. And, there could be a possibility with a lot of construction stuff out that people leave with their parents that is still closed. And I think you guys do a great job in trying to help us market that, that things are open. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this item? Uh, yeah, do we have any Zoom people? We do not. I got to ask to be reminded. I remembered for one. <laughs> no Zoom people. Uh, okay, with that, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, does anyone need to discuss it further, or are we ready for someone to make a motion? Right, I just right, but I think what's in staff has the authority to, they don't have to use that exact window. They just have to use a window that looks like that. So I think we're covered uh, with that. Yes, I'll make, um, I'll make sure it's clear that, that as long as, you know, the window will have to comply with building code. Okay, so do we have a second? Right, we have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote? Commissioner Esty. Commissioner Jensen. Aye. Commissioner Wilk. And Chair Westman. Aye. Aye. All right. Give me a second. Okay. Uh, so moving along, we're on item B, um, which is an alternative design for the prototype street dining decks in Central Village location, uh, up to 25 public, 
parking spaces in the Central Village can be used for this. And we'll wait one moment while our fellow commissioner gets a chance to come back up. Okay, can we have a staff report on this item? Yes. Um, tonight it's the Katie show. <laughs> Three. Presentations. Uh, before you this evening is a request to allow an alternative to the prototype street dining deck. In this picture here, this is really what we're talking about, is the um, modifications. What you're seeing here is what was permitted. Um, the metal railing with planters in between, and they're custom metal railings and cement planters that are uh, were very heavy on purpose. Um, and we're looking into alternatives to that this evening. So little background on this, back in 20, December of 2021, we, the City Council adopted the Outdoor Dining Ordinance for a permanent program. Um, in July of 2022, the Coastal Commission certified that program. And in June, the City Council accepted the Coastal Commission conditions that were placed on that permit. Um, and it was th then certified, sorry, by Coastal Commission on July 14th, 2022. Planning Commission adopted the prototype standards in July 21st of 2022, so a little under a year ago. Um, the first permit was issued this April. It was issued um, to Britannia Arms, and since issuing that permit, um, and I, I do see that the owner is here this evening, uh, they've run into just the the cost of what we originally thought was a reasonable cost, I think we had estimated about $25,000 for three spaces. The costs have gone up dramatically. And also um, the lead times in order to order the goods is also taking time, but it's really the cost that the reason why we're bringing this back. We wanna make sure what's ever built in the right of way looks really good, but we don't want it to be overly burdensome in, ter in terms of cost to the our businesses. Um, so the railings, um, some of the issues were that the fabricated metal, they're installed between each planters. This requires custom built railings, which is very expensive and a lot of coordination between, you know, when your um, planters come in and the custom railings and getting the whole system together. And as I mentioned, the cost going up. And then, so before you this evening is going to be an alternative and it's a, um, a hog wire fence or um, panel, which is a welded six gauge mesh panel that's inside a redwood rail framing for a continuous perimeter, except for the ingress and egress on and off. So we're removing the planters from actually being built into the exterior of the, the deck and then having a requirement to have planters within the deck. So these materials are readily available. We went to Home Depot and made sure. Um, and we would be specific though that the welded six gauge mesh panels be of a, um, a black powder coat because they'll hold up better than the aluminum that we saw with, without the powder coat. And, um, but they're readily available and installation could be done by a contractor right on site, which makes it a lot easier. Um, the planters, the approved planter is a concrete and it weighs over a thousand pounds once you've added the soil. That was on purpose for safety reasons. We um, thought that that would be appro um, appropriate. Right now, the planter lead time is it's greater than 10 weeks. It's a long, they're, they're not built in our backyard. They're quite far away, so they have to get shipped here. And then it requires, once once they do get here, a forklift delivery on site, and then a forklift anytime you need to move these. Um, so quite cumbersome. Um, the alternative that we've come up with is we should, we're thinking it'd be better to allow each business to pick out their planters. They should match throughout the dining deck. The idea was that they would match, but that um, the, Planters could be 30 inches to 36 inches tall so that when you're walking by, you can actually see the plants over the railing because the railing's at 36 inches. Placed one at each corner, um, one at each post along the street frontage. So if there are four posts along the street frontage, there'd be two at each corner and then the two internal posts, there'd be two there. Um, and then two on either side of the entry. 
Um, planter materials could be fiberglass, ceramic, or concrete. Um, we're actually going to change up this recommendation a little bit. Um, Sean spent some time at a, a, pot, a potting store today that had and talk to the owner there. And fiberglass, if if you um, if it's around a lot of people, it can get dinged quite easily and um, damaged. So tonight, we're the one recommended change to this is to only allow ceramic or concrete because they're um, they'll last the longest and not get damaged easily in a public setting. Um, and then traffic safety for each of these decks will have the public works director review and um, she'll on a case-by-case -case basis, they can require rated bollards to be placed at the end of the dining decks. So in areas where there's more traffic, that the, they'll probably be required as part of the permit. Um, so here are some images. We based this on the Riverview pathway design. So um, there, the hog wire is uh, framed in by redwood. It'll be the smooth redwood will be specific on the material list. Um, and then this is examples of different um, planters that are available. On this slide, these are planters that were on uh, the website house.com. These range in price from 600 to almost $800 each. Uh, locally, we went out and um, looked at some planters at a, this is um, on SoCal Ave. Right after you go over Highway 1, there's, a, is it called the Pot Stop? Or Pottery Planet. Um, Pottery Planet. And there, they had some beautiful um, planners that ranged from $299 that were 36 inches tall upward. But there were quite a few around the $300 price range that would work. So the staff recommendation tonight is to allow alternate wood and wire railing at, and um, between 30 to 36 inch tall planters for the prototype street dining deck plans. Um, and that's the recommendation. The, another item that came up was that, um, that would be great to get feedback on from the planning commission tonight is as owners are ordering things, we were, um, like for chairs and all the prototype, the furniture, um, the timing doesn't always line up perfectly. And we've been trying to coach the business owners to just, you know, plan to build your deck when you know you'll have your furniture in place and you'll have your umbrellas so that it all comes together at once. But if the planning commission would like us to be more flexible on that, we could get feedback on that as well. But um, from our point of view, this is, you know, we're finally going to have the the long-term deck in place, and they get to have it for three years once it's installed, and then there can be continuations on this further out, but really want it to look good where it's in the private, in, in the public right-of-way, and was thinking that they shouldn't get their occupancy until they have all the components, such as including the furniture. If they didn't have their umbrellas installed, we would not hold them up for that, but just the the furniture, the deck, the correct deck, the correct railing. So with that, I'm open and available for questions. Sorry. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, but I guess I do. Um, so you mentioned the hog wire. Well, one first question is, is English ales, are they to, are they just, um, are, do they meet up the prototype standards? No, they, the, the one that is, um, that's not a prototype. They'd come in for a custom approval of the deck that they had for COVID-19, which is still in the right of way. Um, and that was denied by the planning commission back in December, I wanna say, of last year. And there's an allowance to allow someone to keep their COVID-19 deck up as long as they're making progress um, on their outdoor dining permit, their building permit. So they do have a building permit in. Um, it's been a slow process though, getting um, a, a couple of, you know, uh, Thank you. submittals on that. Next question is, you showed the, the planters. Uh, I 
kind of assume that the planters that we approved for the prototype were rectangular planters. And you showed round, all kinds of vessels that were count as planters, but that aren't rectangular. Is that, do we have a shape that we specify? So we did. We, the prototype design has a rectangular planter. What we're suggesting tonight is to be more flexible so that the, we can bring down the cost on these. So giving the, um, the business owners the flexibility to pick out their own planters, as long as they're, we're asking that they be between 30 to 36 inches in height, that they can pick color and the materials have to be either ceramic or concrete. So, so more are other materials like steel or aluminum or redwood or something that you decided were unacceptable? Yes. Um, so the aluminum can get um, damaged quite easily. Also, wood needs to be continuously painted and kept up. So we're really trying to utilize, we're, we're proposing materials that um, won't have to, you, you don't need to paint them and they won't be damaged easily. They'll have a longer lifespan. You're not worried about the chipping of the ceramic? Not as likely to be damaged? You know, um, as I said, Sean went out to the pottery store today and was and talked with the owner. If you want to add any. Good evening. <laughs> so to that question, I mean, if you had to say what is likely to be the most resilient material, the feedback I got from the pottery uh, store was that concrete was probably by far and away the, the wisest material choice. Um, ceramic is, I think, an option, but uh, yeah, it's going to be more prone to damage and probably chipping and cracking. But it's, it's still a sturdier option, I would imagine than the fiberglass and the uh, cord and steel, for example. They had options like that. I looked at them as well. And those are the two that, that the, uh, the management there gave the, the most uh, reservation on in this particular use. Okay. Uh, and finally, the, the hog wire uh, ray, uh, metal uh, fencing. Um, why do we pick something very specific? We couldn't just open it up to all kinds of metal. Why do we pick that particular design? Um, due to, again, uh, so we, when you're in along a public street, there's a lot of wear and tear that happens. There's kids that will climb on things. Um, we were looking at possibly doing like the steel, um, cords. the cords, those get flexed really easily and start looking, you know, they just require a lot of maintenance. So because this is in the public street, it's on city property, we're trying to find something that's cost effective as well as has a really nice look to it. And another piece of this is we thought, you know, where the where this has been used along the Riverview pathway and it looks really nice. It's something that is part of our community, like repeating that within the village seemed appropriate. I, I, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I know that we've gone through this whole exercise over the last couple of years, um, and I don't mean to discount that in any regard, but I just, I have to ask if, the, if there's any way to make it easier for the business owners at this point. I mean, it, given the, the fact that it's so expensive and we have this prototype, which I, I agree with the, um, the railing and the hog wire, but since we're utilizing wood on the railing um, and the setup that is down there for the most part is wood. Is there, I mean, I, I know we're specifying ceramic, but is, is there any way to incorporate the wood at this point or just saying that since they look nice, we could utilize their existing planters if they meet certain criteria just to make it easy over, you know, expense wise, methods wise, construction wise, everything. It just seems like especially after listening to Reef Dog <laughs> earlier. Is, is there any outlook for that? Um, that's exactly why we're here. And so this is staff's recommendation, but by all means, the Planning Commission makes the decision here. So it, it, it's, up to this, it's up to the Planning Commission. And if you, um, 
I mean, I understand the utilization of the deck because the drainage and all that stuff, but making it all the necessary improvements to what's what's there, I'm just concerned just for the welfare of the businesses. Like mm -hmm. this basis. No, tonight you have the ability. Yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we have our okay. discussion. Any specific questions of staff? Um, yeah, I do. Um, so um, going back um, in the previous commission, what was approved, um, there's, if I remember correctly, there's like selected uh, furniture, like options and colors and stuff like that. <clears throat> and so if that's still standing in place, but the planners now will not, they can be of any color. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, the, the thought process, just trying to respect the previous work that has been done by everybody. And now interjecting that now that the planter can not, they don't have to match, they can, they all have to match, but they don't have to match anything specific. Is that correct? What we're proposing is that the the, the businesses have flexibility to purchase um, the potters that they, the pots that they'd like. We're we're suggesting certain materials. I do want to uh, clarify on the the so tonight we were only looking at changes to the railing and the the pots. Um, the furniture itself that's in the the prototype design. There's. Um, so many options to pick from. We just, we stated that it has to be outdoor furniture and it has to be made by one of three, one of the three manufacturers that are uh, reputable man manufacturers that the stuff is gonna last. So that's the only parameters there is they, they can order. Um, they also have to provide, be compliant with ADA. So they'll have to have one, you can't have pedestal tables at, at all seats. You have to have one area that, um, for ADA access. But Sorry, I, so I probably missed I thought before when it was selected, there was obviously manufactured, but I thought there was a color palette that was connected with that too. So any any the restaurant color. had wide open color palette as long as in there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, my next question is regarding um, in the report, it talks about deck also. Was that supposed to be talked about tonight or um, the decking materials? Um, oh, so the decking materials. Um, there's there's two options within the prototype. There's Trex and there's Redwood. So we were keeping both options, but we were asking that we be allowed to add one more color to Trex that would complement the Redwood better. Perfect. Um, and then my other question regarding that, um, my understanding is that the permit said that um, this is our, we'll get will be for three years. Is that correct? Yes, the permit will be good for three years. And so and there's opportunity, uh, there is a potential at the end of three years, any investment they make, if the city council makes a decision, no outdoor dining or something like that, or any commissioner, who, who, exactly, but if there's a recommendation, this investment that they made would be have to be removed because it's only standing for three years. Is that correct? So after three years, it'll be reviewed for, like, what was this is success. Did we have any issues with coastal access? That was really the um, the reason for the three year requirement was put on there by the Coastal Commission, um, so that if there were any issues with coastal access at that point, we could say, this is not working. It's not. It's become an um, an impediment to getting to the beach, <laughs> and then they could be removed. So after three years, the the program will be reviewed, um, and then. It can be continued at that point if there are findings that it has not been an, an issue to coastal access. Okay. Uh, that's all the questions I had at this time. Thank you. So it was reviewed by us or reviewed by the Coastal Commission? Um, by us. Yep. So we have local control. Local control. It could get appealed because we're, it's an ex, I think it's an extension of the, the permit. So it could get, like, they could call it up. They could appeal it to Coastal Commission. Just to be Clear on the composite decking material. You're not specifying the Trek name. They use Timber Tech for that. Pretty good alternative. I think they could. I th they they have to match the colors though. There were they're almost the same. Yeah, and and you can give me direction on that as well. The colors that we picked for that were really um, to um, complement the planters and the railing, <laughs> which are now. Really changed. So I'm mostly worried about the colors, not necessarily the material. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I do have one more question. Um, 
So just going back to like I think uh, Ale House, um, they're in the is there a, on a is there a timeline for like their outdoor dining to stay in place with a permit? I mean, like do you give them six months to get a permit? And if they don't um, go through the process, is there a time like a lapse time that it expires? Yes. So um, as long as their building permit continues to move forward, there there's no relapse. It was really um, an administrative policy that was put in place. At this point, though, I think it would be appropriate for the Planning Commission if you wanted to give direction on that. It, now that we're looking at other options um, to bring down the cost, we do have that application in, but if, if there's any direction on if you if you want me to put a the, the duration was always as long as they had their building permit in. But I was just trying to understand, sorry for the question, um, trying to understand the process. Does, they had to have the outdoor dining decks removed by January 1, I think, correct? Yeah. And so some were removed from the storm. Uh, some were removed because people, uh, uh, restaurants removed them because they need to. And then there were some that were left in place. And then they started the permit process after that period or was that permit process started before they were supposed to be removed? That started after. So I think at that point we reached out to them and said it's it's time to remove the deck or you have to bring in your permit. Um, yeah, and for that one, they the permit that they've submitted to the building department includes the, the existing deck that's out there. So it wasn't, they, they put in the, uh, I think either Trex or the Redwood and the actual deck, but they were proposing their planters again, which was uh, denied by planning commission. So they now have comments back from the building department and planning saying, you can't utilize, you know, that was denied by planning commission. You have to update it with the prototype. So I think tonight they're looking like they're another, um, one of the businesses that would like a less expensive alternative to move forward. Okay, thank you. I was just trying to understand this, the standard that's being yeah. set across all businesses. Some have and some don't. Some got taken out, and, and what the time frame is, and what the process is. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we will open this item up to the public. If there's anyone here who would like to speak, uh, you're welcome to come to the podium. Um, we appreciate you signing in, if you don't mind, so we get your name correct in the minutes, but you're not required to. Hi, my name is Peter Blackwell. I'm with um, English Ales, and I'm the one who has the wooden um, planters on uh, Capitol Avenue. So never let a chance go by to, um, to give a second opinion. Um, with regard to damage, um, I've, I've built my own house. I've built my daughter's house. I've built nine pubs. I currently have Redwood and Trex and all manner of um, materials, either on decks or in building. Um, I have a bit of difficulty in understanding why you have some problems with wood when you look down Capitola, just about the whole bloody fascia is wood. And we don't seem to have a problem with that. Um, concrete and uh, ceramic will chip. Um, repairing that is difficult and almost invariably will show. Wood, however, if it's damaged, you can fill, repaint, and it looks as good as new. With regard to the um, the weight, if that's a consideration, and then the planters that I currently have there, I can fill with stone up to three quarters full, fill it with dirt at the top, and they'll be heavier than any of the other planters that are um, being considered tonight. Um, at the last meeting, I mentioned or somebody mentioned that the uh, the planters were pink, and I mentioned that that was the problem with sending a colorblind person to buy paint. And that was me. So we can match the paint because I have paint left over from when we painted the building. What I didn't get uh, tonight, uh, I, I saw different types of planters. And some of the prices were $300, $600. But that's for a 14 by 36 planter or something like that. The original planters, I mean, I've got... Um, 
42 feet of frontage. If I had planters on everywhere, they would be a damn sight more expensive than the other one, in, cumulatively, than the other one. So I'd like some guidance if I have to put other planters here. Um, how many? How much railing in between? Um, but again, getting back to what I originally got here to say is, um, I quite like what I have. Maybe the, maybe the color needs to be adjusted and I'd be more than happy to do that. But I think it's, um, it's equally as safe and we can bolt those planters to the deck so that um, if they did get hit, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't fall over. 14 seconds left, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to comment on this item? Uh, seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Uh, would someone like to start? Pardon me? Oh, anyone on Zoom? Thank you. There are no participants on Zoom. No, I appreciate you reminding me. I, for some reason, I have difficulty with that. Um, so with that, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. Uh, Can I? I'll be happy to start because I want to. I want to support their motion. And so I was on the planning commission when this first came up. Some of you weren't. And the the thought was that well, this is a this is a public property, so we get to weigh in on the design, and we want to have. You know, if it's if it's a public facility, you want it like a park bench. You want to have some consistently street light lamps. You want to you want to have a different street lamp in front of every business. So the the notion was, well, let's have let's have some consistency. What I've found, however, is that we've gone down the rat hole of trying to be architects and designers, and I don't I don't think we've been successful. Um, you know, it's it's the it's the classic horse being camel being a horse designed by committee type thing, and um, so so I would like to back off my position of you know trying to specify the design. I like what English Ales has done. Now that we've seen these uh, um, parklets in in work for a while, um, you can see how well the owners do it. When they when they get, have the opportunity, the argument about the wood planters is is well taken. Um, so, in my in my attitude is, if we meet safety requirements, and I would specify rectangular planters at least, um, that would probably be my own design only design uh, feature. Um, we would keep the furniture requirements. Um, we open up the deck material to any colors and 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 then just get an opportunity to approve the designs as they come before the, the planning commission because I, I don't think it's I don't think we're s successful with this with this prototype design so far <laughs> so that's that's my comment I was just gonna add to um Bring the microphones all the way up to your mouth because <laughs> I, I was outside. I forgot to, to mention that everybody, I couldn't hear anybody. <laughs> just just a side note. <laughs> That's what I was going to add. But um, I concur with um, Commissioner Will. The, I just feel like if they could, um, if we could evaluate each design as it comes in. I think when we when we first took this prototype and started evaluating the prototype, there is a lot more parklets being shown. And those ones have since kind of petered off, especially on the Esplanade. Those ones seem to be a bit more haphazard and a little scattered and the plants were dead and stuff like that. So the the parklets that have um, sustained, you know, they're, they're, they're really pretty and they're, they're nice and the, the, um, the plants are still living. Everything looks, the businesses that have kept them going have really done a good job and I, I feel like that should be considered moving forward. So is, uh, the original intent then of this prototype was to expedite the approval process? I, I think, Ms. Matthews, well, and the original intent was that 
these were going in the public right of way. And so there was concern that there be some uh, consistency with how they looked in the public right of way, um, as well as how they functioned as far as, uh, you know, safety and um, in, in the community. So, so I'll, I'll also add to that, um, when we were tasked by city council to move forward with, a, with an ordinance, they asked us to build in a prototype design that would be approved administratively. It just needs a building permit. And the ordinance also includes a custom design, which um, any applicant can come to the planning commission and apply for the a custom design. So in the uh, English Ales did come forward with a custom design, and it was, um, I don't remember if it was, Redwood or the tracks, but it was it, it was a new right. tracks with the planters on top, and that was denied at the planning commission as a custom design. Um, but for for the purpose of this evening, because we have a prototype design in our code, we do need to. I don't think we can say the prototype design can be custom. I think I would have to modify the code. <laughs> So if we want to continue to have that administrative approval process that goes through building, we will still have to, I'm sorry, but be a little bit of the designer in this because there has to be an approved prototype design for people to, but we are trying to make it more flexible. That is part of this conversation. So, so we could modify the prototype design based on what you're proposing tonight so our, our proposal tonight is to modify the prototype design to allow this new hog wire redwood fence take out the big planters and just require planters within it that they can pick from and we were suggesting heights if you don't think those heights you know you can you can be more flexible we, we tried to come in with a package that was um, that we thought would work so but if, if you don't if you don't want to regulate the planters at all like it, it's it's really up to the planning commission so could, could we recommend you know them utilizing their existing planters being wood or not um like in, just yeah you could you could require that there's a minimum amount of planters and not be so specific about their design sounds like we could just or you can say they don't have to have planters you can leave it up to them so it sounds like if we just expand the material to include uh, wood or to, to, yeah to include wood or or as far as I'm concerned metal or anything that will hold dirt <laughs> I'm okay with and it, and it's rectangular so that's the prototype we have a rectangular planter not going to specify uh, what it's made out of um, the fencing between planters I don't know can be more flexible on that as well well currently we're saying the planters aren't part of the fencing it's just the new hog wire fence that will be around the surround so the planters are just on the deck on the inside. inside they're right inside the rail yeah so it's just a railing there's no planter incorporated into the railing it's just just a railing and then we were requiring that they utilize planters um, to have a certain amount of planters, two at the entryway, one like flagging the entryway, and then so one in each. So one. I, I'm comparing this to our a, our prototype ADU, right? That we, so we have this standard ADUs that are staff approved for counter level, but it rarely, well, let's just say oftentimes, the ADUs come in with requests for custom ADUs. Mm -hmm probably the majority of the time that's the case. So the way, I, the way I can envision this prototype then would be, okay, here's what we're, this is the kind of thing we're looking for. They take that as a template and they say, okay, we're not gonna vary, out, vary too much from this. We'll still have rectangular planters, they'll be in each corner, we'll have railing, we'll have this, the same deck material, blah, blah, blah. But then they can, but then they could come to us uh, with variations off of that, knowing that they're, you know, following most of the guidelines of the prototype. The, the way I understand it is, right now there are two processes you can go through to get.
get your outdoor dining recipe. You can follow the prototype design, which the city has. And if you follow that, then you just come in for an over-the-counter permit with them. If you want to do something different than the prototype design, you have the, you can come in and you can apply for whatever kind of outdoor dining deck you want to have. Uh, just as um, the Ale Place came in and applied for an outdoor dining deck, but that one particular design got turned down by the planning commission. I do think that um, uh, Katie is correct. We have in our ordinance a prototype design which allows them to get the administrative permit. And if we want to continue having this streamlined permit process, we need to have a prototype design. Right. We just need to figure out what we're going to have in that design and, and what, what's going to be the criteria. But there does have to be a design and a criteria for it to work in the structure of right. being part of the ordinance. Got it. Yes. So, we haven't heard from this end of the... Okay, so with that being said, I, I would expand the material. For, I think the hog wire is great. I installed it myself. It, the powder-coated stuff is really good. Animals could do their thing on it and it doesn't rust. So it's pretty durable. Um, as the planters go, I would not restrict the I would not, not, not allow them to use wood. I would allow wood to be added. Look nice. It's relatively cheap, and since they have a three-year risk of, you know, I can only put this thing up for three years, and somebody in Sacramento, who never goes to the coast, decides that we can't have this process anymore, then they're they're out, right? So they don't want to spend too much money on something they might throw away in three years. That's my one concern. As to the colors, I would, I mean, if you go to Timber Tech or Tech, I mean, you got a wide range of colors, but I think the four you've got for since it's a prototype, that's probably okay. In my Those are my thoughts. Uh, thank you. So um, I talked to a lot of the business down there. The biggest concerns I've heard from this, the whole prototype thing is cost, lead time. And I think, um, you know, I'm glad to see, I, I brought up the last uh, planning commission meeting trying to get an update because we hear this all the time. But I think issues I've heard, um, is the planters, and it seems like that is being addressed, and we're come up with a different uh, option for those. And I could probably get behind the wood planter um, as an option would be fine. Um, the next thing I hear a lot about was the railing, and the railing has a lot of safety issues. From I think we all can say, oh, cable railing is nice and everything, but it does flex, and then it gets to be kind of a safety issue for a, like a kid's entrapment issue. So with a hog wire wire mesh like that that kind of thing will get taken out of play from a safety standpoint. And so I think that addressed it. Also, I think it addresses the turnaround time of shop drawings. And, you know, it's a very in detailed railing that was approved the first time. And so I think to go to those wire mesh, tractor supply, Home Depot, something pretty readily available. So I think um, that addresses a lot of the concerns. With the treks and the Redwood, um, those are two options that I think you know, pretty much readily available. And um, I would just, I would uh, agree um, with what uh, Commissioner Essie said, was I think there should be kind of a, a parameter of set colors that we can not deviate from, because some of those tracks colors can go way off the mark. And not that we are designers or architects, but it, if you've got four or five of those in a row, it could be completely different and maybe get out of control from a standpoint of, the goal was to have some kind of uniformity on it. So I think um, having a set parameter uh, and streamlining the concerns that I've heard and then that the prototype, you know, they could come in if they meet the prototype, they could be off and rolling, getting the railing taken care of. I mean, I'm getting their deck taken care of and start to utilize it. The, um, I have two questions. Um, I uh, would advocate for if um, a restaurant was building their deck out and they had ordered their materials and they showed proof of purchase and the lead time, you know, hopefully the lead time is something reasonable that they could use like their deck. Where, you know, we had the, you know, the whole village has been damaged from the storm and everything. And I'd like to see some flexibility in that 
that if they did procure it, it's been purchased, it is coming. But if, let's say, you know, it got delayed for six or eight weeks, they can miss the whole entire summer, and it's a lot of cost um, in what they've already expended. Um, and the other part to that is with the change in this prototype, um, and if a business has already turned in for a permit, um, is it the same exact permit fees? Or are there ch any changes in the permit fee structure that the permit, um, you, the review time would be less now? Um, I was wondering if a, if a restaurant has already turned in a permit and has already paid for the permit and their fees were, let's say, $10,000, and now it's streamlined and a new restaurant came in today, Crusoe's came in and said they were going to turn in, and the review time's a lot less because there's not as much back and forth and the permit cost would be I'd want that to be reviewed to make sure that because uh, one of the restaurants were the first ones out, they didn't occur the most cost and spent the most amount of money on a permit, and now it's been streamlined, and then everybody else is going to get in the same. So just if you elaborate on that, I just want to be sensitive to that. Sure. Um, so if there's a modification to a permit, it um, so the first review is usually up to six weeks, and then follow-up reviews are typically around two to three weeks, so they would be in the, the faster review category for a modification. So if they came back with a hog wire fence and the new design, you know, that they'd be on the faster track. And um, we'd also, for that modification, we could work with them on, they're not paying for a new permit. This is a modification to a building permit. And you'll handle them as they came in, like yep. a, a extension or turnaround time or something? Yes, yep. I mean, it would fall under our, our typical system of... Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so I can have sure. more clarification oh, on that. Pardon me? I was trying to get more clarification. Sure, go ahead. Um, so someone comes in with a prototype, they get it approved over the counter, and then Jerry's suggestion or comes up, which is, oh, lead times, and I can't get that exact same material, Let's say, for example, it's a different deck color. Uh, would it be staff's um, ability to approve that, or would I mean, it, is there a is there a range of uh, discretion that you have that says, well, that's close to the prototype that you'd approve it over the counter, or, or any deviation would have to come to the plan of commission? So uh, what I was hearing from Jerry was more about the furniture lead time separate. So anything anything that's required in the prototype, we would not have flexibility on. So, so they would come to us then as this they, is yeah, if, custom design. If they said we want to do a, this beautiful tile work, that would be a custom design that comes to you. Because um, Trex and Redwood should be readily available. So I, I'm thinking like now what we have these down to, it's basically... Um, are items that are readily available at Home Depot. <laughs> so I, I don't see any issues with those. But if what I was hearing um, Commissioner Jensen say was if, if the lead time on this great furniture that is six weeks out, he would like to see flexibility with as long as they can show us a receipt that they've paid for it and it's being delivered, that he would like us to have flexibility for them to put different chairs out until those... The prototype chair. So okay, arrives. so that's the same issue though. It's, so your flexibility. What, what is your flexibility? The proto. Well, well, that's a lead time thing with um, with just the furniture. Let's just. So if, if you'd like us to have that flexibility, I'd like to get that feedback from Planning Commission tonight. Because originally we were saying when the we were not going to give occupancy for the prototypes unless every part of the prototype was out there. Because. Um, But if you'd like more flexibility, there's yeah. We'll, we'll work on it. Um, so uh, for me, my comments are: uh, I don't have any difficulty adding wood planters, and I think that um, uh, those can be done. Uh, I did have a question about um, uh, on uh, you've shown a redwood railing with the hog wire in it, and that's not painted. So I'm assuming that the redwood railing with the hog wire is just going to be the natural redwood, not something that's going to be painted. We will re require a clear coat on it. Clear coat. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as the planner is concerned, uh, I wanted 
make certain that all of the planters that are, you know, going to go in the corners of the, that they all match, and that the planters all be, um, and I don't know how to phrase this because I know some ceramic tires, not a solid color, you know, they have some variation in them, but planters without, you know, big floral designs on them and that type of thing. Um, I do think this is going in the public right of way, and I'm not too concerned if they're all red or all orange or, you know, how they work out, but I think they should match and, you know, be, be a solid color. And, um, uh, be within the 30 to 36 inches in height um, uh, to go forward. Um, for the treks, it sounds like we have uh, a range of colors in there that are available right now, and I would be comfortable as long as staff felt that what was being put in was, you know, compatible with that range of colors, if it was slightly grayer, slightly lighter. You know, those kinds of things don't really matter to us. It's sort of the overall palette of colors that we're interested in. Um, I think that, you know, uh, one of the things uh, you do learn over time is, um, you know, you have to be careful about temporary things uh, because, you know, temporary furniture goes in and then it never gets replaced. But I would be comfortable with Commissioner Jensen's suggestion if they could show that they have ordered, you know, the appropriate chairs to go in and they have the tables, but the chairs haven't arrived, then it would be fine for me to put sort of temporary chairs in while they're waiting for that order to arrive. Oh, but I, I would like to know that they have been ordered and they're on their way and we're not going to have the temporary furniture go on and on. Um, so um, it, it seems like we have a consensus, and you all can correct me. One thing we didn't talk about was the rectangle, rectangular shape of the planters. Um, that, it, it makes a lot of sense to me, but it probably does eliminate a lot of the ceramic color. Uh, do we want to sort of take a straw vote on the rectangular shape? I think that's what's cons been. That's a consistent thing. So I would I would be um, okay with keeping the rectangular sa shape as a requirement. I would be okay with that. I don't know. I'm fine. That would just probably exclude any ceramic. They did show us one example of a sort of. I think it was square, but they do have rectangular. I I can go, yeah, that's great. I don't think we should preclude. I mean, we, we, we could say circular, rectangular. I mean, if, we, if they want to make something nice, like a nice arrangement of circular or different shapes, I'm kind of in, of the persuasion to say that yeah, they... I would, I, I would like to see sort of rectangular or square because yeah. I think that's going to work. So. Not not to open a Pandora's box, but now that the planters are going to be on the deck, right, um, are there any concerns that that's reducing the size of the seating on the deck now? And so that, because it wasn't before, it, it wasn't going to be on the deck? Is that true? Definitely. So before the planters were on, around the periphery, so if the, the planters that are on the deck will take up seating area. So um, if, if we're going for a more... A rectangular look, maybe considering something like towards the left here where it's a square and won't take up yeah. as much a floor area, floor space. Yeah, I, I, I'd be fine either way. I just we want to be sensitive to, you know, they would understand that whatever they're picked, they're kind of giving up seating space, right? Yeah. But, but it, it definitely will limit. Um, I think concrete will be like one of what, like there won't be as much pottery available if you don't allow a circular. So just to be clear, if that's from the experience that Sean had. So now I'm confused. My understanding 
is the reason we were having the planters in the corners was this really a safety issue. We wanted something big and heavy with a lot of dirt in it so that when the cars, you know, come bumping down there that that the, the restaurant patrons won't be disturbed or harmed, right? And so now if we're talking about putting planters that are maybe have a small bottom and a round shape and uh, just resting on the deck, it seems like that defeats the whole purpose. Well, I kind of feel like it, I mean, sorry, I don't mean to. Go ahead. <laughs> I feel like it seems pretty speculative to to say that, you know, the wooden box filled with rocks or a concrete planter are going to prohibit a, a car. I mean, we don't really have any data to support any of that. So it's kind of, you know, saying, well, one's going to be safer than the other. But, I mean, we have a wooden rail with hog wire, so it's, I think just coming to the conclusion of what do you want to see just doesn't, I mean, it seems to be the more overreaching issue. And, and, and for that much, I mean, we could say that just making requirements of, you know, have a deck, like modifying the prototype to just say we're, we, we need a deck with adequate drainage, we need a railing, a perimeter railing, and then we need some planters of some type to dress it up and um, with some nice furniture, <laughs> which I, I'm, I would say that the, the furniture that we specified before, if everybody's in agreement that that's, you agree, that's fine, but um, making it kind of an ease of entry into this whole transition would seem a bit more appropriate for the economic climate. <laughs> so you mentioned something about safety bollards that, uh, so that's what's kind of my concern, right? Thank you. Yeah, so the our city, um, our public works director has looked at this, and in her opinion, the the heavy planters could be helpful if a car were to bump. But really, a, a true safety mechanism is a bollard. So she on on the streets in which cars move faster through the city, um, a bollard would be more appropriate along the Esplanade where cars really drive slow. It's not as much of a worry, and she'll look at each deck individually to decide whether or not it should require a bollard. Um, Commissioner Christensen is right on track with the staff thought process with this, is that we've moved away from the planters being a safety component of the deck and more of an aesthetic, um, so just to, to dress it up and give it some life. So that's... That is where this has gone because these are not going to protect anyone from a car. <laughs> these but we, but we're planters. Not prescriptive in just saying how many planters or what total area or whatever we're going to require. So within the prototype, what what I'm suggesting this evening is that we require a planter on each side of the entryway onto the decks, and at the four corners of the deck. And then along the street frontage where the cars drive by, wherever there's a post, there should be a planter. And that will vary on the size of some of our restaurants will have up to five parking spaces. So they'll have multiple posts and have to put planters along each of those. So yeah, it was really an aesthetic to keep the greenery there and the... Now we're taking away revenue because we're, we're those planters are now taking up square footage that could be people sitting at. Mm -hmm. You've changed your whole concept, right? Yep. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, I, it, it looks like it, it's a different concept than I thought I had proved long ago. So how about we say that the planters can be square or round or rectangle? That's really up to the applicant, but they have to be minimum of diameter of 14 or 15 inches, you know, somewhere in that range. So there, and that's not very big. I mean, you're talking about this. And certainly, since the fence is going to be on the outside now, and these planters are going to be on the inside, the planters that we were going to have were encroaching into the inside of that space. So. I don't think these dining decks are going to end up with significantly less dining space on them with the planners because 
they were going to have those planters encroaching into the dining deck space before. And the dining deck was going because I think the planters that we had before, we had dimensions on those, and I think they were like 14 inches this way. Mm -hmm. They still had to fit those in the space. So why don't we just say that um, the planners have to be a minimum of that size. If somebody wants to do more, they can do more. Yes, that's a great point. So that in some areas between the planners, they'll be gaining deck space. Yes. Overall, leaving it up to the business owner at this stage, I, I'm in favor for, I think. Um, I'll make a motion um, that we approve uh, staff's recommendation uh, for the prototype, um, but with the condition that there's um, flexibility. I don't know if it would be like a TOC uh, uh, for the uh, restaurant uh, uh, to use the deck if they have established that the materials have been ordered um, and so that they can use that as soon as they, they possibly could. Um, and those are, and I think with the outline of the flexibility and changing to wood planters at the same time, um, I, I could, I'd like to make that the motion. Did the planters all match? Yes. Should they all be the same color? I'll go match. I'm okay with that. I'll second that motion. Okay. What about the restriction on size? Rules of engagement allow that. 14 inch minimum. So what is the, what does it currently say? Um, that it has to have a minimum height between a, a minimum of 30 inches up to 36 inches. Well, it doesn't have a volume or dimensional. What would yeah. you say about, for example, English ales using their existing planters modified in the existing prototype, like their wood planters? Well, I think they would have to come in and apply for a custom oh, gotcha. design. Right. They don't want to change all of it. To so I know. <laughs> I'll amend the motion then to then to say that it would be... 14 inches. We have, we have a motion and a second. Oh, I thought, oh, I thought I had to, I thought he was asking to amend it, okay. to add do, to it. Do you want to? Oh, sorry. Add a friendly amendment. Do you want to add? Yeah. To include okay, the 14 we'll inches. Of, sure. Okay, so he's adding the friendly amendment. Second agrees with that. Okay, so, so we have a motion and a second. Uh, a more discussion, maybe with more comments. I have a question sure. um is there um a minute are we going with staff's recommendation on the minimum amount of plots so two at the entryway one at each corner and then the posts along the main road yes yes all right we have a motion in a second can we have a roll call vote commissioner Esty. aye commissioner jensen aye commissioner will aye vice chair christensen Aye. And Chair Westman. Aye. Okay, so the motion passes unanimously. I, I can I ask one more question? Because um, I just I don't I, I think this question probably exists in the audience too. So, for the English ales, if they came in with a permit for the prototype design with the redwood fence and the hog wire, can they put their Planters, if they if they meet the height requirement and the width requirement, on the interior of this new, I'm, it, it sounds to me I think they could. They'll, they'll have to design it so they have two by the entrance, and one in each corner and one along. So it may or may not work for them, but they'll have to figure that piece out. Okay, thank you. I, I think I have clarity. All right, now we're going to. I, th I think staff can answer your question because we've com we've sort of completed the item. We can't go back at this point. I don't think. Um, I'm sorry. Is there a, a, a time limit to? Um, uh, we talked about that briefly on, like English sales, they have a time frame to amend their. Or I'm just trying to understand the process from here out for everybody. Yes. So. Um, 
the the permits that are in, they can be amended. So the applicants can come into City Hall. Um, unfortunately, I am not in the office tomorrow, but on Monday they could come in and meet with me and talk through this um, or, or meet with Sean tomorrow. Um, but the timing is they need to keep their building permits on track. Um, however, I do realize that we're into June right now and we'll be open to the conversation of putting their decks on hold if they decide that they don't want to move forward this summer because it's so late. Um, and that, that could be another part of the conversation. So, um, but in terms of if they're not moving forward with their building permit in a timely manner, then yes, the, the prototype, the um, emergency decks are supposed to be out of the right of way if you're not working on your permit. Would that just fall into the guidelines right now? Like when you get a permit, you have 180 days, right? Yeah, you know, we didn't. You can ask for an extension. I mean, just, right? Right, yeah. Um, I have, can I ask one more question? Mm -hmm. um, with English Ales coming in with their custom building permit, um, I think it was a couple months, a few months ago, December, mm -hmm. since the prototype has changed, I mean, is there any, go <laughs> like, if they, I feel the consideration during that meeting was looking at how they related to the existing prototype. And since it's changed so much, is there any recourse on them representing their proposal as a custom design? Um, kind of abstract, I'm sorry, I'm just asking. So under the code, when you've had a permit denied, mm -hmm. you're, you would have to make a substantial change to your application to bring it back in front of the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. So um, if there's desire on behalf of the Planning Commission, could do that, but um, that that is the code language is that if something has been denied, I think it, there's also a time limitation to that in which the time a specific amount of time after one year mm -hmm. you can resubmit for reconsideration. Could we make any type of exception if there's any interest in considering? No, to the code. Okay, I just asking all the questions. But they. So, I'll be available. We're really, we're really not supposed to because. Um, um, I, I, we'd be happy to meet tomorrow. Yeah. Staff will meet with you and and go over it and come up with what your options are because we we just did a motion and a second, so we're not going to change no, what I, we've I, said. I, I, You could you could send that to us or you know communicate it through the staff. Thank you. All right, let's move on to item C, which is the uh, citywide housing element update. And uh, are we going to have a staff presentation? Is our consultant going to be with us on Zoom? How is this going to work? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, we do have our consultant with us tonight, and can you see Veronica and Brett on the camera? Yes. Should I unmute? You can unmute them, and then I'm just not seeing that. Usually there's a little um, something pops up here where you can see. Brett and Veronica, I'm just going to test that we can hear you okay. Uh, yes, um, I'm here. Sure, can you hear me, Katie? Yes. Great. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll start and then hand it off to Veronica shortly. So this evening, um, we're going to go over the, the latest on our housing element update. Um, tonight, we'll be discussing, sorry, I'm going to try to move this. 
Tonight we'll be discussing uh, what is the housing element, uh, what public outreach has been done to date. We'll go over the public review draft, um, programs and policies, and then also next steps. Um, I'd like to introduce our team. We have Brett Stinson of RRM Design Group and Veronica Tam of Veronica Tam and Associates. So what is a housing element? A housing element is one of seven required elements of the general plan. Um, it's an assessment of a city's housing needs and how to best accommodate existing and future housing needs for, the, for our population and our regional population. There's a deadline of December 15th in which we need to submit this to the state. It does not have to be approved by December 15th, but submitted to the state by December 15th. And then it will be reviewed for compliance um, by the HCD at the state housing and community development. So on this slide, we show the process for a housing element update. We're in step two. Um, we're still in the public outreach process. We've gone through our housing needs assessment. Um, Brett and Veronica's team has put together our first draft of the housing element, which has been out for, we've started our public review period. And the next steps are HCD review of the draft, adoption locally, and then submittal to the state. Um, for public outreach, we've made quite a few efforts. We've had, we had an online housing needs survey. Um, sorry, and that, that did conclude uh, this, I didn't update that part of the slide, but that, that finished in March. Uh, stakeholder interviews were back in November. We've had two community workshops, one in February, one on May 16th. Um, the Planning Commission has met, I think, three times on this item. Uh, first in February, uh, then for a joint Planning Commission City Council meeting, and more recently just to announce that the public, re uh, the public review draft was available. And also City Council had a study session in February. Um, we're continuing our public outreach opportunities. So um, with this hearing tonight, and then um, we'll have the, the draft is available right now for comments. And then we'll also have uh, um, avail available uh, opportunities during our adoption hearings in the fall after we get HCD comments. The key takeaways from our community workshop a couple weeks back were um, to attach affordability requirements to future upzoning, density bonus, and value capture. Um, there was some skepticism regarding the state park sites, which continues to come up. We'll see if it makes it into the final draft. Um, there was concern over the high percentage of low income and affordable units that were attached to the mall, and concern uh, specifically that this would um, impact the no net loss issues that are required by law. Um, there was also comments made um, about, uh, would like to see more commitment to programs in the housing element update. We use a lot of softer language and in this, uh, the, the person who commented on this said, we'd like to see more action oriented language such as the city will and then attach specific dates to what we're saying we will do. Um, we also heard, um, we need to protect our existing affordable housing stock in the city. So really putting money or putting effort and uh, focus on existing programs. Also concerns over constraints to build ADUs and a desire to streamline and have more protections in place for ADUs. Um, another theme that continues to come up at all of these uh, at the hearings and the public outreach has been the balance of sites citywide often Capitola is looked at having like uh, the breaking point being the, the creek and we, having um, a better, a well distributed, um, more balanced distribution between both sides. And then also questions came up regarding rent control and um, I'll be speaking about that during the director's report. So. Um, so the public review draft is available. It became available in May. It's going to be available through next Friday for public comment. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand this over to Veronica. Thank you, Katie. Um, 
Now I'm going to go through the housing element, just a little bit more um, description about the contents of the housing element. The housing element is highly regulated by the state law um, in terms of its contents. We need to hit a lot of um, uh, discussions relating the housing element. Uh, uh, needs assessment, constraints, and resources opportunities, and also looked at how we have done in the past. And then uh, last, the, the last, so probably the most important component is what are we going to do in the future? Now, next slide. In the needs assessment, we did we do need to look at the demographic and household characteristics uh, in your community so that we can have a better understanding of what the house um, what the needs are uh, currently and possibly into the future. We need to look at your current housing stock and also your market conditions, um, whether those um, your current housing stock is matching the needs in your community, and also special housing needs. And in terms of special housing needs. Uh, typically, under state law, those are the elderly, disabled, households with large, uh, large households with five or more members, the homeless, uh, female-headed households, and also farm workers. These are the um, uh, the uh, specific households or, or persons that the state decided um, state law really mandates this housing element to look at because. Um, these uh, groups typically have more difficulty finding decent and affordable housing. Next slide. In terms of constraints, I mean, we have the needs and we also need to look at what are the framework of uh, what we can be um, working with in order to address the needs. Uh, we have to look at really governmental constraints and governmental constraints means that it's development regulations and land use policies, what you do to facilitate housing development in your community. We also looked at market and economic constraints and environmental constraints. Now, as a local jurisdiction, you have very little control or influence over the market and certainly have very little um, uh, control over the environment either. But you do have control over the development regulations and policies that you enact as a local um, um, jurisdiction uh, under housing element law you are legally obligated to mitigate um, a development regulations and land use policies that are found by the state to be constraining to housing development. Next slide. Then we look at resources. Uh, what are the resources that we have available to address the housing needs? Um, the number one kind of resource that we have to look at is whether you have available sites for future development. And that's where it's related to development standards and also um, land use policies. We have to, uh, in the housing element, we have to identify sites that are um, appropriately zoned um, with, um, with appropriate development standards that can facilitate and encourage a variety of housing types for all income groups in your community. We also look at what are the financial capacity resources that you have to um, 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 facilitate the development of affordable housing and also um, important public private partnerships because as a local jurisdiction, again, you cannot function as a developer, but you can work with uh, developers, uh, private and, and nonprofit or, or market rate developers in order to provide housing in your community and also work with some nonprofit uh, organizations that may be providing some supportive services. Next slide. In order to kind of um, come up with your next eight years of housing actions, we obviously look at the needs that you have. We look at the constraints that you, 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 um, you're facing. We look at the resources you have available. But we also want to look at what works and what doesn't work in your community. What was the housing element actions that were um, uh, included in your um, previous housing element the fifth cycle housing element and whether those programs are working or not. Um, in looking at the city, what the city was able to achieve over the last eight years or so, um, you as even as a small city, you you were able to achieve quite a bit. You um, updated your uh, commercial zoning to include mixed use practically in, in most of your um, commercial categories. Uh, you have also adopted objective design standards in order to streamline review and approval of projects. Um, you have commissioned uh, prototypes for ADU buildings so that it would uh, allow homeowners to 
uh, utilize those um, uh, uh, pre-approved um, kind of um, plans. Uh, it doesn't mean that the project is pre-approved, but the plans will give them um, uh, a head start in terms of designing their uh, ADUs in the community. You have also created um, like ADU guidance uh, for the public and also updated your inclusionary policy. Uh, you've helped um, mobile home um, um, uh, pro uh, rehab programs to actually provide for rehabilitation of some mobile homes and then uh, provide down payment assistance. Now, those are more limited compared to what you had anticipated, mainly because of the lack of funding. Um, we are including programs in the housing element to really pursue additional funding in the future. Uh, you have also created um, a 36 unit, 100% affordable housing project. Next slide. So in this upcoming uh, eight years of Housing Almond, uh, the Housing Action Plan has um, seven housing um, goals. The first six of them is similar to what you have right now because you've been successful in implementing some of your programs and, and the goal seems to be um, really aligning with the community vision. But what we did have to add is the affirmatively furthering fair housing goal, which is a new requirement of state law, which um, the, the affirmatively furthering um, fair housing really actually um, take, uh, requires local jurisdictions to look at um, the housing policies and, and, and regulations in a very different, um, uh, in an equity kind of lens. And so this additional goal um, is new to the housing element. Next slide. In terms of the um, facilitating housing production, uh, we, um, Katie will go into that a little bit uh, further, but we uh, have identified sites that require, that are based on the current uh, the city's existing zoning and general plan. Uh, we do not anticipate any need to rezone or up some properties uh, at this time, uh, but there is a new requirement when it comes to providing adequate sites and, and facilitating development. There's a requirement to replace um, uh, housing that's demolished um, if the housing is occupied or deep restricted for lower income households. We have, um, you have a fairly robust um, ADU um, environment and also the city has been doing quite a bit to foster that. And so um, we have programs to make sure that the city will continue to promote and facilitate an ADUs and mixed use development. Uh, one thing that we also looked at is other alternative types of housing uh, in your community. What can the city do in the future to look at alternative types of housing that may be um, appropriate to your community, maybe such as um, co-housing, um, uh, micro units, um, and some other um, uh, type of housing that you may be um, interested in the future. Uh, in terms of uh, facilitating affordable housing development, uh, we have to continue the program of mobile home park assistance and preservation of the rental housing. Those are important in your community because um, Capitola in general, your housing prices are high. So preserving what you currently have as affordable housing is very important. Uh, it's expensive to build affordable housing. Um, we also want to um, encourage the use of housing choice vouchers and also um, um, incentivize the development of affordable housing in your community through um, a variety of incentives such as density bonus. Um, we want to continue the community outreach throughout the whole process of um, the housing element implementation, so uh, public outreach doesn't stop with the adoption of the housing element. As the city continues to implement the actions, um, there are additional commitments in this housing element that the city will continue to conduct um, outreach and education. We also have um, the inclusionary housing ordinance and housing trust funds continuing that program because that is one of the probably the key resource that the city has uh, without redevelopment, this is the one key resource that you have in generating some income uh, in all revenue in order to facilitate affordable housing in the future. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, that uh, you 
you have this, there are special groups that have more difficulty accessing affordable and decent housing. So we have a group of programs that address special housing needs. Um, in some of them are relating to complying with state law, uh, particularly with uh, zoning regulations such as emergency shelters, transitional and supportive housing. Um, employee housing and housing for persons with disability. Employee housing in here um, um, deals with employees, um, housing that's for employee, six or fewer employees um, and farm laborers if there, uh, but um, you know, if there is that such need. Um, definitely also addressing the housing needs for extremely low income households. This is also a special needs groups because um, um, people at the extremely low income who are earning about 30% of the area median income, they have more difficulty in accessing affordable housing. And in order to facilitate um, housing for families, large households, and also um, housing for um, um, female head of households, uh, with the uh, expectation that a lot of their new housing is going to be located in uh, commercial areas. Um, so the city have some policies relating um, to um, uh, uh, encouraging development of childcare and daycare facilities in, in more of the commercial corridors. Uh, housing assistance. Um, there are, as we talked about, there are some households that have more difficulty accessing affordable housing. So providing rental housing and home buy assistance uh, is important. Um, the city does have access to some programs available um, through the county and through the state um, to provide assistance to these households. And um, you will see that also um, there is a fairly um, 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 detailed uh, fair housing programs this time compared to your current housing element. There are specific actions that the city will take um, from a fair housing perspective to uh, provide education and outreach to facilitate mobility, meaning allowing people um, to move um, to different parts of the city and have choices in terms of locations and types. Uh, to increase housing opportunities throughout the city, to um, have targeted um, improvements in specific neighborhoods, and also to provide tenant protection and anti-displacement um, policy. So those are the key um, programs that we have included in, and some are new, um, some are continued from your current housing element. Next slide. So one thing we talked about earlier, and you've probably seen this slide many, many times already, uh, one thing we talked about um, is that you have to provide adequate sites to facilitate and encourage a variety of housing types in your community. The, the way to measure that requirement under state law is the, your ability to accommodate the regional housing needs assessment. And in this particular round, the six cycle housing element, our regional housing needs allocation is almost 10 times uh, than, than what you had back in the fifth cycle. And that is certainly a challenge in identifying sites, but, um, but the city staff um, and um, Brett has been um, very active in, in work diligently identifying sites that are under current zoning and general plan. And, and we do not, again, we do not anticipate any rezoning necessary. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Katie, and she's going to go over the site's inventory again. But I do want to emphasize that the the RENA regional housing needs allocation is a planning goal, meaning that we have to identify sites. It's not a production obligation because the city cannot function as a developer. You, you don't have the ability to control the market and, 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 and all that. But we do, the state does use density as a, as a proxy to whether some a site is feasible to facilitate lower income um, or moderate income as well. Um, and primarily focusing on uh, lower income, there is a, a default density that we have to um, meet in order to, to have a site considered to be feasible for lower income. Uh, with that, I will turn it back to Katie. Thank you. Um, 
So we, we have a couple slides of the site's inventory in case there's any questions or comments that come up this evening to discuss. Um, but again, we, we've, we've heard comments of we need to distribute this more evenly throughout Capitola. So we, in the last update after our joint meeting with Planning Commission and City Council, I think we um, met that goal. Where we, got it, we furthered that goal. Um, and this is just an aerial map showing the sites as well. Um, this slide breaks down the different zones and how many of the end of, how many um, of the different income levels are associated with each zone. And I think one thing that is apparent here is that we're really there's a, a focused um, within our mixed use neighborhoods and our regional commercial and community commercial centers to really bring housing closer to our main transportation centers as well. Um, and our shopping areas to really decrease vehicle miles traveled, which is a shared goal for uh, the environment. And then when it comes to our single family residential, you know, I, I, I think the numbers were going to surpass what we have in here with ADUs alone, where, but the state really looks at what our ADU trends are and they won't let us project it higher. It has to be projected um, on the average trend but as recently we came to you and informed you that since november of last year we've had 14 adu applications so and i heard uh this week we received another so it's we're, we're trending up and so i do think our single family homes which are mostly on this side of town will be taking will be developing more of the housing stock than estimated in these graphs um so next steps the public review draft is out um It'll conclude on June 10th. Then we have a 15-day city response period. Um, and it's not like your formal EIR where you respond to every comment, but it's we, we take the comments and work and, and try to better the documents. We were working on the document. We won't be directly reaching out to everyone that commented, but those comments will make it into the packet that goes to HCD to see that we've addressed comments. Um, Planning Commission and City Council, that's our meeting tonight and next week, next Thursday at 6 p.m. Actually, um, yeah, at 6 p.m. for that meeting. And then we'll be submitting it to the HCD, public hearings in the fall. I did send out a request by email for a special meeting in October, just looking ahead. Um, it's the third, third Thursday in October. I hope you all have that saved in your calendars. Um, and then our statutory deadline is by December 15th. So with that, that concludes uh, my presentation. I really appreciate that was a, it's a very long document uh, when you take into consideration the appendices. And um, so I really appreciate my team working um, with Brett and Veronica has been amazing. They're, they've been on task and got it to us on time. So a lot of appreciation there, but thank you Planning Commission for taking the time to review the document. If you have simple edits, you're welcome to bring them up tonight. But if, if you have a, a list of like spelling mistakes or simple edits, that we, we could hold off on those tonight and those could be emailed to, to me at a later time. Tonight we're really looking for comments from the public and the commission um, regarding this document and uh, so that we can respond to it during the response time. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing comments. Sure, thank you. Um, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I have some notes here. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, thank Katie and the consultants for all the work. I'm, the report, as more and more I read, I just appreciated all the detail um, and all. I mean, it was amazing to look at our city in a whole different perspective from a document, so that was great. So thank you for all that. 
Um, so a couple questions I had. Um, first one was, um, it talks about capital is fairly high population density and everything, um, and it says uh, compared to others in the cities in the state. Do you have any like, is there like when it says it's fairly high population density? What, you know, how does that really measure out across the state? Um, we could add that. We could get more specific in that description. As uh, in the document, we're very clear that we are the most dense of the cities within the Santa Cruz. Um, county, so we'd be happy to add that to the document and find some comparable cities, coastal cities. All right. Um, the next one in paragraph three on page 144, um, um, it talks, um, the report, could the report also reflect the goal uh, for the city to have workforce housing? We talk about affordable housing, but um, you know, I think we've heard a lot about workforce housing, and I think it'd be nice to highlight that as something as, as a goal for the city. Um, on that paragraph three on page 144, I didn't see that noted. I was wondering if, that, if that's something that you could look at to see if that's the right place for that to be noted. Sure. Um, the next one was um, on page 312. Well, on page 26, but then also there's some notes about it on page 312. It talks about uh, the transportation, um, the metro and stuff. Um, should we include a part in there about the grant that was just passed um, recently? Um, you know, it, in those notes, it talks about that there's four electric buses. I think that's the number they threw out. But, you know, they're going over to hydrogen and stuff because the report talks about how bad the environment is um, and air quality and stuff, and I think it might be nice to maybe update. I know that was just passed recently, but maybe that can be reflected in the report, and so somebody reads this, you know, at another level at a different time, they can understand that it's not just our city, but also the county's taking steps towards that. Yes, I'll uh, bring our consultant up to date with the recent. All right. Um, one thing on page 100, it talks about the typical permit process time. Um, uh, for the city of Capitola, you know, to encourage development. Um, just speaking from a personal level, doing being a contractor and doing development, um, we should be, you know, it, the, I think our city should be applauded by the turnaround time permits are here. Um, I work in many other jurisdictions, especially over the hill. 10 months, 12 months, 14 months, San Jose. Um, so I think it should be applauded by how quick the staff and your outside consultants do turnaround permits. And so I, uh, I appreciate that just from, from being a contractor, I appreciate that turnaround time. But I also I think our community should appreciate um, how efficient that um, you and your department run that. Um, the next thing, um, on page 104, it talks about traffic constraints. Should we also know in the report about the new improvements that are happening on Highway 1? Right now, they talk about it talks about the improvements we made in 2017 and stuff. And I thought, um, you know, with the new, and I don't know what the exact dollar amount was, but uh, the shoulder busing, and I don't know what the exact terminology is, but it'd probably be nice to have that reflected. Bus on shoulder. Yep. Yep. Bus on shoulder. Yep. Thank you. Also, on page 104, um, it talks about water supply and infrastructure. I was wondering if we should talk about um, and have it reflect what SoCal Water District's doing with the recharge station that they're putting in. Um, again, I don't know the exact word. It's so clean water or what's the? Yeah, pure water, SoCal. Thank you. Um, I you know that's a, an amazing project that they're putting in place. And um, in talking to their staff, I mean, they think that's going to solve a lot of our water issues coming up in the future. Um, sorry, I just have a couple more. Um, uh, under, um, the, I know the city council just at last city council meeting took some action on rent control. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be great to have that noted somewhere in the report um, that the rent control for the, um, not just the Cabrillo mobile home, but I think it was also addressing other mobile homes, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, just one small quick thing, sorry, just on page uh, two, on question 20 on page 212, it just doesn't have a date, it has just XX. so. Um, um, if we can just pick up that, wherever date they're talking about of that meeting. 
Um, and then on page 325, right, oh, you. Um, uh, 325, it talks about the parks in figure 48. And I didn't see noted um, that the Jade Street Park um, was highlighted. Um, and maybe I just missed that, but if we can just uh, reflect that. And then just uh, in summary of questions, um, in the there are numbers, it talks about, you know, on the western part of Capitola, there's about 1,350 units. And on the um, eastern side of Capitola, they're talking about 227. Um, I don't know if you know off the top of your head or if it could be maybe uh, looked at, but if, you know, with on the um, west side, the number being at the 1,350, how many of those units are exactly at the mall? And so when we look at what the number really is, I've heard the comment from a lot of people in the community about making sure that this has been distributed equally across the city. If I know the mall's still on that side, but if we took that part of it out because there's an opportunity there, what are the numbers per se between the one side to the other side if the mall part was taken out? So I don't know if you know that off the top of your head or maybe that can, I don't know if it should be highlighted, but I just hear that a lot. And then I try to explain to them that a lot of those numbers are at the mall. So those are all the comments that I had out of the report, but it was very detailed and thank you for all your work. Okay. Thank you. This, I think it's 850 at the mall. At 850. So then that, that, that number drops down to uh, 500 compared to the 227. Correct. So about twice. And just to note, um, in the last cycle, you know, we had 600 Park Ave. We also had the development on Hill Street. Where, so there were more units on this side of Capitola the last two cycles. Um, but it's audit, it'd be an administrative approval if we were to keep those sites in right now because they've been in the, in the housing element for two cycles. And if they were included in the next housing element, so just when you when you are having those conversations, you can also explain to folks that in the past it was actually that we had more on this side. But if we reutilize those sites, one we haven't seen any interest by those developers to redo those sites, and two, if we did use those sites, um, it, it's more risk to the city, I guess, in terms of review process. But thank you for that clarification. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to echo the comments about the the, uh, the report. I think it's very thorough, it's, you know, extremely well done. I think we've updated a lot of things based on some of the feedback we've gotten. Um, in my review of HCD's comments, and maybe Veronica can, can answer this question, throughout the state, because we're in the second wave of cities of going through this whole rigmarole, um, the majority of the rejections seem to be on the basis of properties that are just the cities are proposing, but they're just not um, they're not likely to be developed in the cities in the state's um, viewpoint, right? There are several Culver City, I think, got nailed on that. Several in the Bay Area also were rejected, and I go back again to my insistence that the mall is our number one thing. Um, and I was looking for a more positive statement here about commitments to mall development, but I, maybe I missed it. I don't know if we have anything that we can say that we are doing we, along the lines of, by this date, we will do this, um, to try to convince the HCD folks in Sacramento that we are serious about the mall development that has been stalled for quite a while. Right? Yes. We yeah. not want to get rejected this time around because we didn't you know, pay attention to that, that element of this thing. So I don't, I don't know if that, Veronica, if you have any comments about that and what you've seen in other jurisdictions. I can quickly, just because Veronica is not aware of this, our city council has directed us in the um, coming year, there's money in the budget to really, um, we'll be studying the most effective way to get the mall to redevelop. So we've got $25,000 to put into a study to see what, what is our, our best alternatives in order to help redevelop the mall. So that, that's something that Veronica can add to this document to state that we're we are engaged. We do we want to see redevelopment. And we're st we're starting to study it. So, um, but Veronica, with that, do you have additional comments? 
Uh, yeah, I think, you know, the council, um, the, the plan commissioner is definitely true. Um, getting the substantial evidence that existing uses would not impede um, the development, I think that's important. But I think the city staff has been in communication with um, the mall, and, and I think adding the, the study would be a good um, demonstration. I think um, as we move um, closer to the review, you know, um, submitting the housing element, we can also look at what additional um, kind of more concrete action that the city can take uh, to facilitate that. But uh, that's a very good point. Um, it is the most difficult uh, task uh, this round with the housing element, and that's the reason why so many jurisdictions are still stuck. Um, um, but I think that's a very good um, start that the city have with the, the feasibility study or however you want to call it that. Yeah, because to be blunt, this thing's going to get reviewed by some bureaucrat in Sacramento that doesn't know anything about Capitola. So the more concrete um, things we can put in here to, to show that we're, we are doing the best we can to develop this mall or redevelop this mall. Uh, I think that would help uh, get this thing through the state. Um, that's, I think we've done a good job of trying to spread it out over the, the city and address that comment that we've got all over the place. But, you know, we're, you're sort of limited by geography. And I think we've done a good job. Of that. That's, that's it for my side. So oh, I would just like to ask one quick mall question since we're on that topic before we go down to this end of the table. So um, at one point in time, the city had a million dollars um, left over from when the city had redevelop a redevelopment agency that is dedicated to the mall. Mm -hmm. And I believe the city still has that money available. And uh, I was wondering if it would be appropriate because we all know that, you know, affordable housing is going to have to be a part of any mall development. Uh, if it would make some sense to dedicate, if not all of that money, a portion of that money to, you know, help subsidize affordable housing on the mall. Um, when I was on the Finance Advisory Committee last year, I asked Jim Malgrove about that, and he says, you lose the money. We have lost the money. We can't get to 900. I may be wrong, but that's what I recall. I will. I'll double yeah, check we'll on find, that. We'll yeah. find out about that. But if we have it, it seems oh, like spend it. It 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 might help us in this situation. Yeah. Sorry, Dino. So we'll go down to this end of the table, Peter. Would you like to go? Yes. Okay. So um, I wasn't sure how to review this document, and you know, and, and it's glad you mentioned that we were not going over the spelling errors and things because I had a lot of questions about those but fortunately I was able to talk to Brian and get a lot of those things uh, addressed but I did have one major comment and that is the executive summary so my understanding is that again this is going to be reviewed by some bureaucrat in uh, at the HCD which are very confident and but doesn't know about um, uh, Capitola and so I've written a lot of uh, documents and submitted them to customers throughout my career, and the executive summary is is a very important, and it, it talks to Paul's point, which is we need to point out the good things we're doing in terms of cooperating and making big strides towards um, towards uh, meeting our re requirements and the place to highlight those and get them fresh on everybody's mind is in the executive summary. So when they see them again, deep in the document at page 486, they say, oh yeah, I'm, you know. So, you know, for example, the mall, that should be highlighted in the executive summary, all the things we're gonna do about that. Um, you know, the fact that we've already approved a high density, um, so we're, we're, you know, we're already proactively make. So you could probably go through the list of of things that are really, you know, we think are important that we really, accomplishments we have done and are doing, pull them forward and pop them in the executive summary so that um, so that this bureaucrat will, will have it fresh on his mind. Um, so uh, other comments. Um, I was thinking about the uh, the development of 41st Street. Like, so, so we have a high density along 40, 40, excuse me, 41st Street, that's a, 
That's a good corridor. There's a lot of reasons why we want to develop that. And it occurs to me that perhaps, uh, since we also have a rail trail activity going on, that we might suggest to the RTC or get at least in their mind that maybe we could have a rail spur going down 41st Avenue, down the median. That would suddenly bring transportation to all the development we're, we're getting. And I'm not saying that that's a necessarily a practical idea, but if it's a trolley um, that, that, can, that can spin off of that and um, just put it in the, in the RTC's mind that, hey, start looking at this. This, this, could be really, this could really help with our transportation needs and help with the low-income people get around, get to Watsonville, get to Santa Cruz. So I thought that was at least something that, that uh, we can maybe toss forward to the city council or the RTC and say, well, there's something we can do uh, that's not just zoning. It's, it's, it's actually proactively getting, getting a, an environment for low-income housing. Um, I was going through the document on numbers. I uh, saw that the, on page 311, there was a reference to uh, variance on height variance that went up to 50 feet. And that seemed to be inadequate to me that, uh, especially if we're going to do a development on the mall, and, we weren't, and we're going to go from 623 units to 850 units, and they want to have parking on site that that's you know we're talking three four five six stories i don't know how long how high it's going to be but we don't want to we don't want to discourage that right and also we have the units on park avenue which are have higher density um let me see i have the i have the page number on that but it's the one that has 32 cubic du per ac 32.6 those are that's a three-story and so i'm sure that's those are over 50 feet as well. And I would think we would want to encourage the, the high density units. Um, and, so, and so things like the, the, the 50 feet seem to be in a, inconsistent with what we want to do as well. And then there was also on page 5-7, no, no, what was it? On mm -hmm, similar, similar question on parking. Let's see. Yeah, page 312, table, three, table 312, um, there's a parking variance, that, that, which is another thing that might be needed to be updated because, again, on Capitola Road, we just approved something with minimal parking. I don't know whether that exceeds our parking variance or not, but we, we should go through this again and make sure that, we are, that our numbers and our variances are large enough so that, so that the big projects that are going to encourage density and... and um, and low-income housing um, meet those requirements. Um, da, 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 da. The other, yeah, um, I guess the rest of the questions are more in the um, hypo kind of question, so I'll, uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I, I think this is a great, comprehensive, long, <laughs> exhaustive um, report. Um, I, I especially like the provisions that you outlined with the homelessness and emergency services. Um, I agree with emphasizing um, about the mall projections, but I think that's about, I think you've got a lot of it covered. I'll, I'll email you a list of typos and things that, that I found in the document so we don't take up time with that right now. Um, one of the comments I wanted to make is, um, I guess, uh, in looking at the fees that we charge for someone to build a housing unit in Capitola right now, uh, you know, I was a little surprised that, you know, before you can even put a shovel in the ground, it's going to cost you basically $118,000 um, in, in fees to build a new residential unit. And um, uh, one of the bigger fees in there is actually the affordable housing impact fee, which the city has adopted itself. And in 
going and because I did read that ordinance today because I was a little interested in it. It seems like that particular fee is not going to generate a tremendous amount of money because it talks about, you know, new housing uh, going in basically on a vacant lot. Because if you're tearing down a house and building a new house, the fee doesn't apply. You're doing an addition that, you know, doesn't increase the square footage of the existing house more than 50%. It doesn't apply. I mean, there are all these exceptions in there. So I'm sort of scratching my head and going, you know, how, how many times are, are we going to collect this fee? And then we, we don't collect any fees for, you know, parks, transportation, um, administrative administration, you know, the whole the list goes on. And um, while we probably don't want to do it at this point in time in this housing element because of our uh, time constraints, it seems to me we ought to look hard at, you know, what kind of fees we're charging because that certainly has an impact on how many units get developed. And since we're going to have, um, you know, additional units uh, provided in town, we also want to make certain that our town provides services for those units. I mean, is it appropriate to, you know, have a child care fee because we talk about, you know, the problems that that has in childhood? Is it appropriate to have a parks fee because Certainly, with housing becoming more dense and less open space, uh, you know, parks and recreation are going to become, you know, one of our uh, key components. So I would just like to see, um, you know, the, the city look at that idea in the future. Uh, and I would like to express, as everyone else has, uh, thanking the, particularly our staff as well as the consultants on how well this whole process has gone. I mean, anyone who reads this document has to be impressed by the amount of information that's included in it, the thoughtfulness that's gone into it, and uh, we really appreciate all, all of the work that you have done. So, we appreciate that, and Veronica and Brett have been amazing and our staff, so thank you. I mean, I've seen a lot of housing elements over the years, but this is certainly one of the, the better, thorough, more accurate ones I've seen in a long time. So are there, is there anything else you need from us as a commission? No, nope, that, that's it. I really appreciate how much time. You have one more comment you'd like to make? At our last meeting, we talked about um, looking at a couple of sites that were um, was that what's the process in that or is that so um, we've we identified two sites um, I d I've heard from both property owners that they're okay with us utilizing those sites one is across the street from 4401 Capitola Road the other is uh, the sporting goods store that was on 41st Avenue so the process there is it's really um, there'll be minimum uh, interaction with the property owner will get some some input initially from them but then it's really our um, we'll take the steps to kind of figure out with what we've developed in our housing element what could fit on that site so and be able to show what, what you know how it would fit on that site do you have anything to add to that Brett I think you're on mute Sorry about that. Yes, that's a good assessment. We're working with our architecture team on um, the concepts that are in line with the protective units and the housing element constraints and program constraints. Yeah. We are, we're, we're realizing um, with our contract, with all the work that's going into this, there's definitely, um, there's more work than they anticipated. So I, I, I would like to understand how important those build-out scenarios are to the Planning Commission. Um, to keep this in budget, we could possibly just do one site so that, um, because we're just, or um, if you'd like the two sites, I think I just, I need to go back to City Council to ask for a little more money to 
keep us within budget. So is there uh, is there a I'm not sure I even follow the, the yeah so so this is one of those this was kind of an optional item when we um, when it wasn't part of the scope when we had put it out for bid. But RM included this in their work, and they're known for their design, and, be in, and this is a big component of what they do. Um, so I thought it was important for the public to kind of see how these, how projects could be built out and how this density could be achieved on a site. But as we're running, as we're going through this process, um, I've asked them to do extra hearings because I think it's really important that we have Veronica and Brett at these meetings. So we're, the, the budget for this, we're starting to go a little bit beyond this, the budget because of additional needs. Um, so we've had one amendment made in order to do that joint session with the Planning Commission and City Council, which was a great meeting. But it, it start, you know, there's, there's some items that we're realizing that for all these public hearings, it's really important to have the whole team present. And so we can either like stay on budget and remove one of the two build out scenarios or um, I can go to city council and talk about this this project and the possible need for more funding. So for, My so. recollection was that we were unanimously all in favor of the one site of the old outdoor world location. We had sort of split opinions on on what the second site would be uh, so for me personally i would be fine with doing the one that we all sort of agreed we wanted to do i don't think there's a need to do two but i think that would that keep us on budget then if we had just one I, i'll need to talk with them about it but that that was one idea i had of maybe if we cut one of those how we can save a little money there so i i can yeah. agree to that i agree I think that would be really illustrative to see such a, um, especially a project that's been discussed before, mm -hmm. and see how the density would apply to, you know, that specific site. I'll, I'll pursue that avenue and see. Yep, and with that, I don't think we have anything else for you on that subject matter. And, and so. we don't take any action tonight, so. No. Nope. Can I ask one more? Let's receive our comments. Can I ask one more question, Katie? Sure. Um, uh, Last meeting, you were asking if we found any additional sites, potential sites. If there, I mean, it's not a, given it's not a vacant lot or a vacant commercial building, say it's a currently occupied space, are those still fair game? They are. If they're like recently redeveloped or if they have multiple stories, or they maybe not. Okay. So it really, it has to be one that's feasible, but if you if you have some, please email me and let me know, and we'll take a look. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Okay, so we'll move on to the director's report. Okay, I have a few updates for you. Um, first update, which is kind of the the biggest news, is um, the. Um, the rent control ordinance was passed. There was an, uh, an emergency ordinance passed at City Council um, last week, and we're going. We, we also are doing a regular ordinance with a first and second reading, and the second reading will happen next week. So, um, if you'd like, I can bring you an overview at some point. We're, we're, um, it was really a fast and furious effort to get that across the finish line. Uh, because rents were expected to increase today at Cabrillo. But this isn't just written for Cabrillo, it applies uh, citywide. Um, so we're putting together right now kind of a, a cheat sheet on what the ordinance means for the residents of Capitola, and it'll be in English and Spanish, hoping to have that out possibly by the end of next week. So our city attorney's office is working on that. Um, the other big update, we've all, I've had quite a few inquiries from Planning Commission in the past to keep you up to date on the Kaiser project, and they've actually withdrawn their application at this point. Kaiser has decided to refocus their energy into their existing locations and do improvements uh, throughout the county and at existing buildings. So that project that was on the frontage road is has now been withdrawn. Um, we received, or we, we recently approved uh, the, 
our first SB9 application. This is located at 204 Hollister, the small red buildings up on Depot Hill, that property. Um, one of the, that was actually, it's two properties. The property to the left sold previously and is going to be a single family home with an ADU. The property on the right, 204, brought in an SB9 project to subdivide the lot into two lots and they're going to keep two of the units towards the, I believe towards the front and then uh, redevelop and have two a, a new duplex or two single lots up to 800 square feet towards the back. So um, it's interesting. Uh, we're going to learn a lot from this. And as we go through the process, I can. It, it won't come to you for review, but I really want to show you some of the things we put in place and how it's affecting how they're going to build this. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, on June 22nd at the ne at City Council, uh, there's going to be an, a, a presentation on 1098 38th Avenue by Mid Penn. They've come to they've bought a, a piece of property next to the rail trail uh, for affordable housing, and uh, they're coming to the City Council to ask for funding towards the planning of the project. And so I just wanted to make sure you're all aware of that and to tune in. It won't come to Planning Commission until we actually have either a conceptual review application or a, a review, but I think they'll they'll give a, a glimpse of what they're thinking for the site. I think it's gonna have a lot of, uh, be oriented towards the future rail trail, which is just three years out, it looks like. Um, on July 20th, this is letting you know what's happening, what we're expecting, so we've, this is when, at the time of year when we, um, because of July 4th, we're gonna meet on the third Thursday of the month in July. So that's July 20th and in August, it'll be the same, we'll meet on the third Thursday. Um, but at the July 20th hearing right now, we don't have much on the agenda. We have uh, the color and materials board discussion, which we got an indication of that tonight during the <laughs> discussion on the outdoor dining of color and materials. Uh, we have an application at 4805 Crystal, and this is for an ADU. Correct, Sean? 4805 Crystal is an ADU, in addition for an ADU, so that'll be coming to you. We also may have code enforcement for both uh, Reef Dog and Castagnolas uh, due to uh, non compliance with outdoor dining. So hopefully those will be in compliance and not on the agenda. And at this point, we're just unsure with the other projects because there's a lot of um, incomplete applications that we need things to come back in in order to make it to a planning commission agenda. So um, with that, that concludes my report. Okay. So now we go to commission comments. Um, just one thing. Um, I, I think I talked about in the last city council, uh, last planning commission meeting. Um, are we able to talk about the issue um, with the obscured window, that it seems like every time it comes up, or was that ruled that oh. it, it was a code issue? Um, it is a requirement of the code, but we can talk about it. That we can definitely talk about it. It just might have to be an amendment to the code at a future time. I, yeah. Yep. If, I, if we could talk about that at the same time, I, that'd be great. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I had. I just had one comment I wanted to say. I. I I've always thought being a planning commissioner is one of the more difficult jobs in the city because we are really, you know, restricted by a whole lot of rules about how we look at projects, who we can talk to about a project, you know, how that whole system works. And um, I think it's difficult because you have members of the community approach you or, you know, you we want to not appear that we're you know, bureaucrats who won't listen to, you know, any modification or any change. And I, I have come to recognize over the years that one of the reasons those rules are there is that we really do need to treat every applicant the same way. Every business in the village needs to be treated with the same respect and, um, you know, follow the rules by. So um, I apologize if you think, you know, not letting um, the guy from the ill place boss or, you know, us, our inability to deal with the reef dog issue. It's just that 
if we if we are going to follow the Brown Act and follow the rules, which I think that we need to do, that's just the way it is. I would have had to recuse myself from the re obvious discussion anyway. I might not have remembered that. Yeah. Let us see. Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, I appreciate your leadership on that. I mean, you know, uh, in advising us on when we should be discussing things and when we shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard sometimes, but we got to follow the rules. All right, with that, our meeting is adjourned, and we'll see everybody next month. Thank you.